This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Hi there, welcome to the program. Glad to have you along for the next 30 minutes. As you can see, Kenny Bergamy is off this week, but as always, we have got a lot of good stuff to show you today. Coming up, if you're 25 and older, have over $1,000 in farm revenue, and have a wild hog problem, then boy, do we have a program for you. Also on the show, through good values and fellowship, how this 16-acre farm in Albany is making an impact not only on the residents of the community, but also on the local economy. And then later, if you like digging through farm fields, looking for arrowheads, then you are going to love this story. Hear from a longtime collector on ways to make your hunt a successful one. These stories and so much more are starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, given the fact they cause an estimated one and a half billion dollars in damage each year, invasive wild pigs is one of the biggest issues facing the ag industry today. However, thanks to a new program from the USDA, farmers can fight this problem at a fraction of the cost. Damon Jones has the story. While disease, pests, and drought are major concerns for farmers each and every year, this would also be near the top of the list as feral hogs damage property, crops, and even the environment in at least 35 states across the U.S. And the harm done isn't usually noticed until it's too late. We weren't looking at the field on the back side, on the wood side. We didn't really have any reason to go there. And uh, when it came time to harvest corn, we realized that we probably had lost as much as 10 acres of corn. And it was probably making around 100 bushels. So if you do the math, you would find out right quick that we lost more right there than it would have cost to go and buy a trap. And that's where the USDA comes in as they recently started a cost-sharing program for those farmers looking to invest in traps. We ask farmers to participate in a relatively short survey. The entire thing will take 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and as part of that process, they're able to submit a bid for what percentage of the trap they are willing to pay. And the rest of the cost is paid for by this program in an effort to make things more affordable for the farmer. And the USDA has also made getting the process started pretty easy. So if you're interested in participating in the uh, 2017 auction, um, you can go to agvise.us and see all of the information about the project. There's a video from last year's auction that will tell you about the, the program. Uh, or you can visit us in the Agribusiness 3 building at the Sunbelt Expo uh, this year at, in uh, Moultrie. So I expected they would be there. I didn't do any previous research and would figure as easy a way to do it as any would be just to go and look and wandered into this program uh, and realized that it was an opportunity to save some money uh, and it pretty much made up my mind to buy a trap. While the farmer will only be responsible for a percentage of the cost, the companies USDA have contracts with are some of the most reputable in the industry. That means you're guaranteed a high quality product. The, the traps themselves are very easy to use. The trapping system that we're incentivizing has a full year of monitoring that goes with it. You can monitor the trap from your cell phone or iPad or computer, activate the trap remotely from your smartphone. Um, and so it, it really is a, a very, very user-friendly way of trying to deal with this hog problem. And once the traps are installed, USDA makes sure the farmer is happy with the process. They, they followed up, checked to make sure that the whole program had worked and that, that the trap was there and installed. Everything was, was right by the book. We didn't have any trouble. And with this cost-sharing system, farmers are encouraged to be more proactive in fighting this problem as the more people taking part, the better. I really think that one of the things that would help with the problem would be to get more people involved and get a, more of a community-wide uh, trapping program. Reporting from Terrell County, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Thank you, Damon. Well, no doubt one of the best known peanut farmers in this country is our former president and Georgia native Jimmy Carter. Having just celebrated his 93rd birthday, the former president and his wife Rosalind on hand in his hometown for this year's annual Plains Peanut Festival. A salute to fall and to Georgia peanuts, but only some of the reasons why the annual festival attracts a family audience. 
Now, naturally, the industry likes to remind consumers of the benefits of peanuts and the many products that are associated with it. And who better to speak on their behalf than Greg Mills, president of Alpharetta-based Golden Peanut and Tree Nuts. We're going through a period where plant-based proteins are, are exciting and they're, they're in a secular trend for demand growth. And peanuts are healthy. They impact diabetes, they impact obesity, they impact uh, the precursors to cancer, and just about we're just about ready to have a study talking about how they impact advanced macular degeneration and, and help cure that or at least limit the impact of that. So eating peanuts every day or at least two or three times a week in small helpings are good, they're healthy for you. They're sustainable, they use less water and they create more protein with less water and they fix nitrogen in the soil and then they're very affordable. So in places around the world where peanuts are, are the protein source, they're also affordable for people in Africa people in uh, India, people in Indonesia and, Ch and China, they can use the, the peanut as their protein source. Meantime, it's officially fall, y'all. The season of festivals, beautiful scenery, cooler temperatures, and of course, delicious North Georgia apples. Orchards have already been busy harvesting the apples, but they will get a lot busier in the next few weeks. Our John Holcomb recently visited North Georgia and went to one of the several orchards that are spread throughout the area. Hey, John. Hey, Ray. Yeah. The farm I visited is called RNA Orchards. It's a family-run orchard located off of Highway 52 that's been in business for 70 years now. RNA has a lot to offer, including wagon rides, ciders, jellies, and 40 different varieties of delicious apples. This fall, thousands of people will be heading to North Georgia to get their hands on some freshly picked apples. Here at RNA Orchards off of Highway 52 in East LJ, is one of several locations where consumers can get them with plenty of varieties to choose from. Uh, we grow approximately 40 different varieties here on this farm. Uh, we start picking uh, our earliest apple, which would be Lodi in late July. Then we we'll move into Pristine in July, and then we end up with Pink Lady, Gold Rush, and Limber Twigs in November. So between July and November, we go through 40 different varieties of apples. As you can tell from the crates, conveyors, and freshly packed bags full of apples, the harvest this year has been a good one for the orchard. Uh, the harvest is going uh, uh, long good this year. We're, uh, all the apples have been uh, seven to 10 days early. So other than that, everything's going along great. We're well into our harvest. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll finish up picking sometime around before Thanksgiving, and, uh, but our harvest is going well. This year is a special one for the family orchard as they celebrate their 70th year in operation. My grandfather started the orchard in 1947, so this is our 70th year here on this farm. Uh, my mother and father started in the business in 69. Uh, me and my wife, Jennifer, came in the business in uh, 93, and uh, we have uh, been operating RNA orchards for 70 years. Since it starts 70 years ago, the orchard has grown greatly. The family runs the store, which offers consumers far more than just apples every day of the year. The store is packed full of ciders and jellies, and they even have their own in-house bakery where they make mouth-watering apple pies. We're a year-round business now. We stay open nine to six, seven days a week. Uh, we offer apples uh, July through March. Uh, we have a full line bakery in the market. We have 14 different varieties of uh, our fried apple pies that we make fresh in the kitchen every day. Uh, the apple, peach, and strawberries made out of our fruit that we grow. The fun doesn't just stop in the market store. They offer a lot of other fall festive activities all throughout the season. We, uh, we run the wagon rides uh, through the orchard in October on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, and give people the opportunity to you know, see the farm, tour the farm, ride the wagon, and tour the farm. Um, you know, November is, uh, we'll carry right on into November, which is, you know, pumpkins and uh, fall time. As mentioned, RNA will have apples all the way up until March, but of course they're open all year long, so after then you'll still be able to get some jelly or an apple pie from their bakery, Ray. All right, John, great job, sir. Well, when we come back, the amazing story of healthy living farms in Albany, Georgia. Their vision to provide fresh food options, promote health, and wellness and to stimulate the local economy.
Hello, I'm Keaton Walker, Georgia National Fairgrounds Marketing and Sponsorship Director. Growing up, I showed livestock here personally, so being able to come back and work at the facility that really kind of influenced and changed my life and molded me into the person that I am today is every person's dream, and I tell you, I'm living that dream each and every day. Just being able to, to come here and see kind of what's already been in place for those 20, you know, five years that um, before I started, and then being able to take what they've initially gotten started that's been working, that's been continuing to grow, and then just take that and jump leaps and bounds and continue to grow and change things and kind of evolve with the times. It has been so much fun and an incredible journey, and I have loved every minute of it. I'll tell you, it's just kind of been eye-opening. Um, you never really know what goes on behind the scenes at the fairgrounds. You kind of early only see what the product of what the hard work and dedication that um, kind of evolves at the fair and the rodeo and at some of our other events. But being able to come out here, work, and influence, you know, kind of what the fairgrounds looks like, the overall aspect of it, and work with the team like what we have here is absolutely incredible. It's not only just a fair in October. We have events all year long, and for people to be able to come out here, a lot of them spend their vacation time. This is where the family comes and spends a week's vacation at a livestock event or a horse show. And being able to work at a facility of this magnitude, I tell you, is absolutely incredible. They get to enjoy their time here with their family and friends. They get to make those lasting memories. I'll tell you, some of my fondest memories with my family is um, livestock shows that we were here and participated in. And, and those are things that you're going to remember. You know, you may not always remember what ribbon or what place you got at that particular show, but you're going to remember those memories that you made with your friends and family and the friends that you get to make while you're here. Some of those people you may not see but a couple times a year, but they are some of the truest friends that you will have and that will last you a lifetime. As the CEO and manager of Healthy Living Farms in Albany, Georgia, Charlene Lover tells me she is a true believer in divine intervention. You see, Charlene is also a minister and says the farm business model is based on strong religious principles. According to Charlene, that divine intervention took place while she was gathering information for the local Chamber of Commerce. We were looking at data about the community and things that we needed to do and at the same time we were having some of our larger industries downsize or relocate and consequently I began to learn some of the statistical data about the health and the fact that um, we had a real issue with diabetes and hypertension and uh, even infant mortality. A lot of what I began to learn is that some of our health issues are pervasive based on uh, diet. And so we realized that there were no options or very little options for um, healthy eating. So we decided that we would look around and see what are the options we had to be able to bring uh, food for healthy lifestyle as well as employment because we were on a downsize with some of the major industries. And so consequently I talked to our, our, our team at our church, Trumpet of God Ministries and Training Center. We started talking about how can we solve problems or how can we create solutions and we looked at what we had in our hand kind of like Moses and we had land in our hand and we found came upon the property that we're at now we acquired the 16 and a half acres we're now an urban farm growing on about three and a half acres and we're a naturally certified naturally grown farmer we produce about 10 different types of vegetables and as a result of that we began to look around in our community and thought this is a way that we could service our community and as we grow the business that we'll be able to offer employment to perhaps some of the people that are not readily employable. We have some of the most um, committed congregants and team leaders that serve with me. We have about 20 people that I can call on at any time to help us do work on the farm. So they help us plant. I have two farmers that have about 25, 30 years together, conventional farm training. I have people that come out. We have segments of the farm that we've divided up and we have people that are responsible for a certain produce. They'll help plant, they'll help weed and keep that area clean. And so it wasn't a hard pitch. It was just more so than talking about the farm. We talked about the vision of how we could solve problems or be a solution in our community. And from that perspective, it evolved into we're going to grow produce. And I've had such a tremendous support. 99% um, of our team members are all volunteers. 
Uh, we have a rotation schedule of people coming in. They make a commitment on their schedule of when they're coming in the week or what day we send out the work plan. This is what we need to do. And we have a response back saying, I'm available for these many hours this week. I'll be there to help you do it. We're building our social media network so we can keep those people engaged because I think people really appreciate the quality that they're uh, finding in our products and that people want to. They're becoming more health conscious, not just weight conscious, but health conscious. So they're wanting to eat in a way that's nourishing for their bodies. So we're trying to incorporate providing the food, providing the education, also working with our youth. Um, we've started to do field trips and we did our first field trip in May. Uh, we have um, one of our educators who's put together our curriculum to meet the Georgia standards so that we can make the field trips very educational to introduce our children to agri-science, agribusiness, and agriculture. Right now we sell from our local market. We've just been introduced to a couple markets in Atlanta that we're going to do our first wholesale from this harvest. And so we're hoping to be able to be um, a broader uh, community of servicing the business industry with our produce. Yeah, such a great place to visit and all the community and outreach contributions they make, just amazing. You can read all about those by logging on to healthylivingfarms.org. You can also find them on Facebook. Well, if there's a farm field loaded with Indian artifacts, he will find them. A collection you must see to believe when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Like I've always told young ones, if you make money, save it. The bad one's coming. The yields were above normal. What we picked, some was over three and some two and three quarters. And I've had yields at that level, but not over basically every acre that's grown here. That was the big difference. Talk to the farmers, they say this was the crop of, of a decade for them. That's really the crop that folks are going to make a profit on this year, uh, right up until this happens. Uh, one week ahead, we were picking cotton as fast as we could. We wanted to make sure to get all of that out of the field before it hit, so there was 24-hour long shifts going on through this area. We buttoned down everything we could and, and left, went to LaGrange. We don't have flood issues here. They're saying we had a little less than 15 inches. I haven't figured out how you measure it when the wind's blowing 130 miles an hour, but that's what I was told. It looked like a bomb went off. Cotton modules torn apart, buildings torn apart. The, the damage to the power lines, the infrastructure through here is pretty amazing. The eye wall passed through this area, which means we had the strongest uh, winds and as slow as that storm was moving, we had those winds for a long period of time. I've got some fields that we didn't get to. They appear to be picked right now after this. I've got some modules totally destroyed in the field. The crop was harvested before the storm hit, but we unfortunately are losing it now. Uh, the conventional modules, the large rectangular ones, many of those are, are heavily damaged. We lost the, uh, the top off of that with the wind, and then we got a lot of rain on top of those modules combined with water seeping up from the bottom. Um, so I don't know how much we'll, we'll be able to gin in the end. Uh, I don't think we'll know that for a, a few weeks yet, but uh, I don't think it'll be much. You see a lot of the round bales, which in appearance look good, but depends on how wet they are. They may not be as good as they look. Farming on the Gulf Coast, this is always a risk and everyone knows that. You just hope it doesn't happen. Um, folks that are 30, 40 miles to the south have no problems whatsoever just unlucky enough to be in the, in the path of one of these storms. You just need to get out of there, save your, uh, your family and what you can there, and, and come back and repair what we can after the fact. Finally today, deep beneath the soil of America's farmland lies the buried secrets of ancient Indian history. But finding those artifacts, such as arrowheads, is easier said than done. That's why when you see and hear the story of Moultrie, Georgia's Johnny Dickerson, your first response will be, that is amazing. Be 
Behind this door and on display is what can only be described as a labor of love. For as long as he can remember, Johnny Dickerson has been venturing into nearby farm fields looking for Indian artifacts. His findings have resulted in one of the most impressive and diverse collections one has ever laid eyes on. I really don't know exactly, but I was young, maybe nine, ten, and believe it or not, picking cotton in a field with a sack, not with a cotton picker. And uh, I would find the airhead and I would say, good gracious, somebody, they, nobody's touched this thing in thousands of years. And I'd put it in my pocket and I'd get home, I'd put it in a drawer. And I had a few airheads and then, then I just quit. Actually, it was more like an extended hiatus. After serving in the Navy, Johnny then found work with an irrigation firm installing pivots. That's when he says his passion for hunting arrowheads was renewed. The owner of the irrigation firm, which was Cloudburst Irrigation, he, uh, he collected Indian artifacts. So it got me back enthused about doing this again. And then we started going, to, him and I started going to, we'd go everywhere hunting arrowheads. All, we'd, we'd always go to the high side of the creek after a farmer had plowed his field and it rained on it. We'd, we would walk, we wouldn't look over four feet in either direction. And we, had, we were pretty successful. Uh, enjoyed it and still enjoy it and it's just it's just something to me to be able to pick up something that somebody has not touched in maybe as much as 10,000 years. And for a first time Indian artifacts hunter like myself the thrill of trying to find an arrowhead is simply amazing. Now if you're out in the field and come across something like this don't be confused this is not actually an arrowhead. These are flint chips that according to Johnny are the result of the Indians making those arrowheads. That's hard flint right there. See, look at there. This is patina, this is not. This is a harder flint than this flint. I can be walking and not see an arrowhead, but I feel it. I feel it, it's coming. And it won't be a second later, you'll reach down and pick one up. And you, you've not looked at it, but you know it's there. It just draws you to it. And uh, I guess that's the Indian spirit coming out in me or something because my grandmother was full-blooded Lower Creek. My daddy was half Lower Creek, and I guess I'm a quarter. First of all, you need to hunt Indian artifacts near a creek, river, natural sink. A natural sink is where you see a bunch of uh, cypress trees, usually around the natural sink. But the water is got that tannic acid and it's black, clear water. And uh, you got a pliers fill. It needs a good rain. We like about two to three inches of rain on it. We know that they'll be sitting up like golf tees when, when, you, when you let it rain on it a while. But then you can't wait till it lays by. They, that means they roll it one more time up, get, get a little dirt up closer to the root of the plant, and uh, then it rains, and then you can go again. It's just like a new field. And every year is going to be different. I have picked up 100 this year and maybe 150 the next year. Uh, so they just don't. They don't run out, so you don't accumulate this in the day. You know, you got to work at it, and, uh, but I enjoy it. If it was a job, I wouldn't do it. Good old Johnny, he is certainly one of a kind. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but we will see you next week, same time, same channel, right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week.